Greetings, everyone, and welcome to podcast 16 of the Solar Coaster series autobiography by R. Kelly and uh, a diary of me. So we're going to get right into the reading and we are on best of both worlds. The vision I wanted to bring to life with Tupac still haunted me. I wanted to marry rap and R&B in a way the world would never forget. With Biggie and Tupac gone, though, I wasn't sure who could fill the bill. There were some strong rappers, but I needed the strongest. For some time, I'd been thinking about Jay-Z. He had been moving up the food chain and building his audience. Our relationship had been cool. When he asked me to come off my download tour to shoot the video for Guilty Till Proven Innocent, I said yes. He came to the premiere party for my video, I Wish, a song from the 2001 TP2.com album. After watching it, Jay said he thought I captured Pac's vibe, and he asked if I wanted to work with him on something. At first, Jay was thinking that we would do a single together, but when I suggested that we do an album, he was all for it. That's how the Kells Jay-Z collaboration began. It was excited, thinking that... This could be the colossal R&B rap merger I've been dreaming of. We'd already done two collabs in 2000. I'd sung the choruses of Jay-Z's Guilty Till Proven Innocent. In 2001, Jay-Z did the hot verse on Fiesta. We cut an album together called The Best of Both Worlds. The best of hip hop meets the best of R&B. That was released in March 2002. We announced a tour that year to promote the album, but those plans were postponed after charges were issued against me. The following year, Jay dropped his black album. The following year, Jay dropped his black album and wanted to promote it. Just back from Europe, he needed to fill up giant venues around the country, and I knew I could help. The best of both worlds did okay, but we both knew the real money could be made if we toured together. In 2004, the idea of touring together and bringing the fans the best of both worlds tour is what really got my creative juices flowing again. Jay and I have finished working on another album, Unfinished Business, with some of the unreleased tracks from our 2002 collaboration and a couple of new songs. The plan was to promote Unfinished Business during the tour. I put all my energy into prepping and rehearsing for the Best of Both Worlds show. I had an idea for staging the opening frame. A video could run during its opening. Two tour buses, Jay and one, me and the other, would be on the run, pursued by police and media helicopters. One tour bus would crash through scenery on the right side of the stage. The other would crash through on the left. Then we would join up in mid-stage and do the title track, The Best of Both Worlds. As our opening number, Jay didn't love the idea at first, but he finally came around. It turned out to be a spectacular opening. From there, though, things went downhill fast. The most persistent problem was lighting. Since the start of my touring career with Levert, I've always been highly sensitive to lighting. It can make or break a performance. My lighting has to be exactly right. That's why I said, Jay, let's settle on a mutual lighting guy. Not your guy, not my guy, but a neutral guy. No problem, Jay agreed. I think you're right. At the shows, my lighting was all wrong. The guys wasn't picking up my cues. The dramatic moments when the mood needed to be dark and mysterious or dim and sexy or up and happy were not lit to my satisfaction. Spotlights failed to find me on stage and dancers were missing cues because of lighting disconnects during their routines. I tried to contain myself, but nothing means more to me than giving my fans an exceptional show. I threw a fit. I'm a guy who choreographs his every move on stage. Now my fans couldn't see where I was on stage. I knew I wasn't imagining things because I record every tour show performance so I can critique it the next day. Every Best of Both Worlds tour tape that I played back was extremely disappointing to me and didn't measure up to my standards because of the lighting. Finally, a crew member told me the truth, that the lighting guy was Jay's regular lighting guy. I went to see Jay so we could discuss the problem without a lot of middlemen involvement. I was sure that we could find out a solution. I said, Jay, the tour is about making us both look good. 
I realize that, Robin. I know you're unhappy, but there's not much I can do about it. We can find another guy to do the lights. He's under contract. We're stuck with him. We talked some more. Promises were made that things would improve, and I left the meeting optimistic. Later, he came to me and asked, would you mind if I use your throne you built? Go ahead and use it, I said, thinking that could calm the waters and get him to make his lighting man do the right do right by me. I had built this throne, a massive king of R&B chair that I used during my middle segment in the show. The understanding was clear. After I used the chair, I'd leave it on stage so Jay could use it. What happened, though, was that Jay's people got the chair for Jay to use before I came out. As a result, people were thinking that I was biting off of Jay's style rather than the truth that he was biting off mine. Another thing, before the show, Jay made a big deal about putting up big scene advertisements for his black album. When I asked to have a big screen picture of the current R. Kelly record, his people said no. If the lighting had improved, I might have let all that go. But the lighting got worse. I did everything I could, even simplifying the lighting cues for my show so that I could at least have the bare minimum of lighting effects that I wanted. But even that didn't fix the situation. At one point, I became so frustrated that I left the stage during a show in St. Louis and went to the place that gives me comfort in times of trouble, McDonald's. But this time, I didn't go to eat. Instead, I asked the guy working through the drive through window if I could borrow his cap and uniform. And for the next three hours, I served Big Macs, fries, and Cokes to customers. As the tour went on, Jay's crew and mine were at each other's throats. Sets came to abrupt endings, shows were canceled, and all sorts of crazy stuff was popping off. By the time we hit Jay's hometown, New York, everyone was on edge. Considering the pending trial, the unnecessary drama was hard to handle. Right before the Madison Square Garden concert in October 2004, I received a threatening phone call. When Jay-Z and I opened with our first act, there was a dude a few rows from the stage just glaring at me. He opened his coat in a way I consider threatening. I can't say for certain if he had a gun or not, but it was enough to put me on guard and mess up my groove. When I returned from my solo set, there was another guy in the bleachers opening his coat, gesturing like he had a pistol. When I left the stage for a costume change, I told my business manager and the promoter that I wasn't planning to risk my life finishing a show. The show's promoter convinced us that everything was cool and we could go back out. On my way back to the stage, a member of Jay-Z's crew pepper sprayed me dead in my face. Not only did he blast me, he got my booking agent and some of my crew as well. I had to go to St. Vincent's Hospital for ambulance, by ambulance where they put little tubes in my eyes to flush chemicals out so I wouldn't lose my sight. If I hadn't been wearing my stage stunners, the doctor said I might have gone blind. As I was leaving the hospital, I was met by a group of reporters all asking me if I had heard what Jay-Z had said about me on the radio. I told the reporters that I didn't know anything about it and that I had every intention of continuing on with the tour. It was only later that I found out that he said that I was jealous and insecure and he called my actions foolery. When I arrived at Madison Square Garden the following day with the tour buses with my band, backup singers, and dancers, we were turned away and not allowed to enter the building. In the meantime, several Jay-Z's music friends had conveniently shown up to help Jay fill the show out and replace me. Even more conveniently, seven f several friends had been there the night before and had finished the show while I was at the hospital. Jay-Z continued on the road without me. We found out later that the friends had booked their tour buses two weeks before the garden show. Later, I issued a press statement. The fans deserve better than this. I'd like the show to go on. It's really disappointing that Jay-Z and the promoter didn't. Charges, counter charges, and lawsuits flew back and forth between me and Jay-Z, but neither one of us wanted to leave a bad taste in our fans' mouth. Our collaboration album, Unfinished Business, was officially released worldwide about a week before I left the tour. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 chart in 04 and went on to become another platinum selling album. Although the concerts came to an abrupt end, our album delivered the full Jay-Z R. Kelly suit to fans. The truth is that although I'm a fan of his music to this day, 
the business between me and Jay was finished. Happy. It's ironic that some of the happiest music I've ever made came at the unhappiest times in my life. That's no accident. The longer the legal nightmare went on, the more I needed to make positive music. It wasn't only my natural instinct. It was my way of surviving a negative situation as well. I was doing it for me, for more than me. I was doing it for all people caught up in the struggles. That's mostly everyone. So many of us are caught up in a financial mess, a medical mess, romantic mess. They're hurting for some kind of help. They need to turn their mood around and take away the pain. Music is the medicine. It's better than any drink or drug. Plus, there's no hangover or danger side effect. Chocolate Factory had been healing a healing record for me and my fans. I wanted to outdo myself. I wanted to keep the love party going. I wanted to make the happiest record and at the same time, the most spiritual record of my life. So in 04, I released a double-sided soul and gospel CD. One side was You Saved Me and the other was Happy People. I had to teach and preach my truth. Music makes me happy and saves me from misery. Name the singer who sings the saddest blues like Billie Holiday, and I'll guarantee that while she was singing her blues, Billie's blues went away. Music cuts through the sorrow of life. It turns sad into glad. That was my purpose with happy people. Like Marvin Gaye's Gotta Give It Up, Wars, All Day Music, or Sly and the Family Stones, Everyday People. I wanted to give another long-lasting gift of happiness. <clears throat> Throughout the record, I'm very friendly, very good weatherman, which is also the name of the first song, One, Two, Three, Love. Around the time, Happy People, I was asked to sing the national anthem before the Bernard Hopkins, Jermaine Taylor mid midweight fight. I wanted to do something different, so I did a remix and created a Steppers version of the anthem. I choreographed my performance and brought real Steppers into the arena while I performed. Most of the fans loved it. Some didn't. Someone said I had... Marvin Gaye, the Star Spangled Banner, Time.com described my rendition as an ill-advised smoothification of Francis Scott Key's original song. I took all this as compliment. In the words of Sinatra, I did it my way. And for those who said I disrespected the country, I wish them love by pointing out that singing and dancing can be performed um, as a praise. I was praising the national, the nation with my song, just like other songs of mine, praise God. God was the theme of the second dish, you saved me. The three-way call echoed the struggle I was going through. I could be happy and happy people by singing songs about sunshines and good times, but when it came to God, I had to come with all my fears. I had to come in the vulnerable state I was in. I had to call my sister and find my prayer partners. Through prayer, the rest of the songs flowed. You save me, prayers changes, prayer changes. I surrender, spirit, leap of faith and prayer. I always pray for my wife and children, but I pray for them more than ever during those years before my trial. For all the struggles Dre and I faced as a couple, I wished her nothing but peace of mind and happiness. Every day I thank God for our three children, Joanne, Jaya, and Robert Jr. The bottom line for me is always family. Nothing matters to me more than my family. No offense to God, but when my kids are around me, you wouldn't want them. You you won't want them in heaven. You want them to stay at, at my house. You wouldn't believe the good times we have. There's nothing I'd rather do than tell them stories about prince and princesses and castles in the air. Their minds are so open. Their curiosity is addictive. My kids are my best audience, my favorite people in the entire world. I talk them, I, I take them into the studio with me and watch them toy with the instruments with the silk way beyond their ages. They sing and write songs. And as much as little Robert loves his father's music, he might love Michael Jackson's a little more. He also has his MJ dance routine down to art. I love kidding and teasing my kids. So we're watching SpongeBob. I probably start calling Patrick the starfish character, SpongeBob the star of the car the cartoon series. That's not SpongeBob, Dad, they scream. That is his best friend, Patrick. 
with pretend authority, I'd hold my ground. He, hey kids, I know my cartoons and I know that SpongeBob. I say pointing to Patrick. When one of their friends came into the room, I'd switch over and start talking SpongeBob by his rightful name. That's right, Daddy. They said that's SpongeBob. When her friend left and Patrick came on the screen again, I say, oh, there's SpongeBob about to get into more trouble. No, they scream. You got it all wrong. But now they're playing along, screaming and laughing at the same time. I love making my kids laugh, but I also take pride in teaching them about success. Not just the glamorous parts, but also the struggle and hard work that creates success. I've always tried to be real with them about business. At our house in Olympia Fields, Thursday was pool and pizza day. We spend the day together playing in the water. I remember one Wednesday night though, I came to them and said, sorry kids, but tomorrow I've got to go to this, into the city for a meeting. I can't miss this meeting because it means a lot more money for all of us. So tomorrow I have to get dressed up to make a good impression. I hate to miss the pool and pizza party, but I have no choice. Daddy, said Robert, you promised you wouldn't ever miss a pool and pizza day. I know, son, I said, but tomorrow is super important for my business. The look in little Rob's eyes made me my important meeting seem silly. On Thursday, I waited until the kids were in the pool before I put on a $2,000 suit, $500 white shirt, and a $300 red silk tie. I shined my best black alligator dress shoes, grabbed a brand new leather briefcase, and strode out to the pool to tell the kids goodbye. How do I look, kids? I asked, stepping fairly close to the pool. You look nice, Daddy. How about this suit? It's a pretty suit, Daddy. How about this tie? I asked, stepping a little closer. Pretty tie, Daddy. Well, your daddy's going into the city to do this big business deal, I said, stepping even closer to the pool. And I don't want nothing to go wrong. With that, I faked like I slipped and wearing all my fancy clothes and hold my briefcase, I went flying into the pool. The kids howled with delight. i never seen them crack up like that. When I climbed out soaking wet, all they could say is, oh, daddy, you're so crazy. Juicy Tuesday. During my legal ordeal, not only did I keep making music at a crazy place, I also kept playing ball like my life depended on it. I hooped almost every single night and try not to miss a night to this day. I never miss Tuesdays. They were the big night for intense hooping. It's it's come to be known as Juicy Tuesday. My niggas know I never miss a, ju a Juicy Tuesday. That's when the best shooters show up at the local gym. Sometimes even NBA players come down to elbow, bump elbows with me on Juicy Tuesday. It's fiercely competitive. Because I'm a night creature, we sometimes don't get started in Hell around 1 or 2 a.m. I play for at least two hours. When my team wins, I love to ride the losers. Boasting rights are big with me. I get a kick out of pointing out how many games we've won in a row and how badly we crushed the other team. On one particular Tuesday night in 04, I was warming up when my security guy spotted an unfamiliar brother hanging around. He asked me what he should do about the stranger. Ask him his name, I replied. After asking, the security guard came back and said, says his name is Charlie. We'll go ask him his last name. A few seconds later, the man came back. He said his name is Charlie Wilson. The Charlie Wilson, I asked. Charlie Wilson of the Gap Band. I went right over to him and saw that it really was the Charlie Wilson. Man, I said, it's really good to see you. Been loving your music forever. Just didn't expect to see you here. What's up? I came all the way to Chicago looking for you, Charlie answered. The cats told me that this is where you come on Tuesday, so I figured I'd take my chances and try to catch you. I'll be honest with you, bro. I need a hit. I can't believe this. I said, Charlie Wilson is coming to me for a hit. After all those years of studying you, the least I can do is write a hit. Then you're willing? It'd be an honor. When do you think you can get started, Rob? Right after I hoop, hang around, Charlie, the minute... I'm through playing. We'll head to the studio and start working. After the game, Charlie and his woman came to my house and I took them right to the log cabin. By then it was around 4 a.m. While I was fooling with ideas, they fell asleep in the easy chairs behind the engineer's board. I was happy they did. When I start writing, the early drafts are sometimes pretty crazy. The, the spirit of criticism in the room can sometimes dampen my groove. I need to be free to go in whatever directions, twists, or turns the song may take. 
If, for example, someone says, oh man, that sounds terrible, it can throw me off the journey and ruin the whole operation. Talking about operations, later when I told a business associate about I had met Charlie and immediately took him to the studio, the associate said, you were going to write and produce a song for him without a contract? Didn't you want to have signed document before you began working? If a patient goes to the emergency room and asks for a doctor to help, I said, should a doctor start asking if he has insurance? The brother asked for my help, and I was the man he came to. I wasn't about to do anything except help him and write him a song. The song came to me quickly. The creative process flowed, our real-life encounter on the basketball court. I remember when security told me someone named Charlie was hanging around and how I asked about his name. That's how I came up with the titles Charlie, last name Wilson. When Charlie woke up, I had the song, but before singing it to him, I felt I had to say something. No disrespect, Charlie, but there's a whole new generation out there who don't know who you are. I want this song to be about your name. You're introducing yourself to a whole new world of fans. You got that right, Rob. No argument there. That's why I want this song to have your name. Fact is, I want this song to be all about your name. You're not only introducing yourself to a fine honey at the club. You're introducing yourself to a whole new world of fans as well. I played it and Charlie loved it. Right then and there, he sang it. He didn't argue with any direction. He understood that he was putting on a custom made suit that fit him perfectly. It ain't right how you turn out hit so easily, Charlie joked when we were through. It's easy when I'm writing for you, I said, real easy. Charlie, last name Wilson, did what we had hoped. It introduced Charlie to a younger R&B audience. It was the name of his first single, a major hit, and also the name of his album, which sold more than 71,000 copies in the first week of its release. The album went to number 10 on the Billboard 200 chart in 05, and was eventually certified gold with sales surpassing the 500,000 mark. Charlie was back and now everyone knew his name. That year, my work schedule was beyond crazy. There were songs I was writing for other artists. There were the remixes of my old songs. I was hard at working and recording my seventh studio album, which I decided to call TP3 Reloaded. The wait for the trial became even more drawn out. The pressure of the accusation serves as my motivation to keep working on songs, songs, and more songs. I could go 48 hours straight without sleep. If I did manage to fall asleep, an idea would wake me up and shake me until I had to run down to the studio and start recording what was in my head like a cannon stuffed with cannonballs. My head was stuffed with songs. Night after night, day after day, week after week, I kept firing a cannon that never emptied. The legal stuff is getting complicated, Robert, one of my lawyers told me. So please be conservative in your music. Impossible. I couldn't rein in my music any more than a fisherman could rein in an alligator. I was still reaching for my daring metaphors. I believed I caught a good one with sex in the kitchen where I was able to marry two human comforts, food and sex. There were other songs on TP3. I got deep into the low the slow grinding reggae jam, slow wine. I found another wild metaphor when I told the honey to treat me like a remote control. Touch me, turn me on, make me sing a song. Now put me on slow, push enter. Now fast forward and you program me. Hit, hit it till the morning and sex weed. Got the sex weed. I just want to hit it all the time. These songs were cool and they kept my musical engines burning. I wanted to be heard in the club and I wanted to be played on the radio, but my mind was also expanding into a whole different form. I started seeing way past the single or even an album. When I was so confused, when I saw confused me, what, okay. What I saw confused me. My music started to look like an opera with the winding connected storyline that underscores human drama in everyday compilations. You might say that the other forms, the ballads, the jam, the sexy dance groove were starting to make me feel a little trapped. Trapped was a word that played nonstop in my head. Trapped. You could draw a lot of conclusions as to why during the seven year period leading up to a trial, I suddenly felt that I needed to branch out into a longer musical form. 
Maybe it was the letdown from the canceled Best of Both Worlds tour that made me want to retreat to my basement in the chocolate factory. Perhaps I was going back in time to take refuge in that period when Lena McClain exposed me to singing theater and opera. Maybe my legal dilemma inspired me to think about other people who were also under the gun. Maybe I was just feeling increasingly trapped and the concept was something I had to think about and deal with every day. Maybe it was all these things. Whatever it was, the idea of trapped in a closet crept up on me like an alien from another planet. I didn't go into the studio with the intent of writing a screenplay, but the lyrics, seven o'clock in the morning and rays from the sun wake me up. I'm stretching and yawning in a bed that don't belong to me. Just came into my head. And as I sang them, I could picture the entire scene in my mind. Unlike my other songs where lyrics led to video, Trapped came to me as a drama in need of a score. The song scared me at first. I had no idea where the story was going. It had a life of its own. After I was two minutes into it, still singing a verse, my crew in the studio started screaming how much they loved it. And I was just as curious as they were to find out what would happen next. Their reaction fueled my desire to move from writing verses to actually writing chapters. Chapter one finds my character, Sylvester, the narrative, waking up in a bed of a married woman. Her husband comes home and he's forced into the closet. His cell phone rings. Her husband reaches for the sound while the closet, while in the closet, Sylvester sings, check under the bed, then opens the dresser. He looks at the closet. I pull out my Beretta. Chapter two opens with the confrontation at gunpoint. The woman's husband, a preacher, has a confession to make. He's been on the down low and figures his wife's actions are good enough reason for him to come out of the closet about his love affair with a man. As the chapter progresses, we learn that Sylvester's woman is at his house kicking it with a policeman, the same cop who gives Sylvester a ticket on his way home, and on and on until the compilations can't get any more complicated. One character led to another, one scene led to another more intriguing scene, one betrayal seeped into another more whacked out betrayal and tricky situation became even trickier. Trapped in the Closet started as a 16 minute song that I recorded for TP3. When the executives at the label heard it, they didn't know what to make of it. A 16 minute song with no chorus and no hook. The president of the label said he wasn't sure if I was a work of genius or insanity. To their credit, they supported that vision and let me fulfill my lifelong dream of mine. Although I'd always come up with the concepts and co-directed my music videos, Trapped was so much more than a music video. This was a mini movie. I was involved in every aspect from set design, casting, costuming, editing, teaching, actors, their parts, everything. We did everything like it was a movie and a lot of crew we hired were movie people. In the beginning, I was a little worried about whether the art, art actors would accept me acting with them and giving them direction because this was my first time really working outside a music video. But it was smooth and I gained a lot of confidence doing Trapped. And my co-director, Jim Swafeed Field, had, had some great ideas about how we could achieve some of the things I wanted to do without having Hollywood movie doing it. But I definitely am ready for the movies now. Even before I was a singer and artist, I wanted to be a director. I love telling stories and Trapped is a quite, quite a story. On TP3, I included the first five chapters on CD. An initial run of the album included a DVD of the miniseries. Before it was over, there were 22 chapters, and to be honest, it's still not over. The chapters were more than songs. They were scripts. Soon, they were long-form videos where I played five different characters. Sylvester, Old Man Randolph, Reverend Mosley, James Evans, and Pink Luscious. Everything about Traps challenged me. The writing, directing, acting, producing, and the way the package was presented to the public. The plotting of Trapped had me in creative heaven. I could let my mind be free at a million miles an hour. When I'm tra working on Trapped, I put the music on the speakers in the studio and the story just comes. In the beginning, I had no idea what was going on, gonna happen next. The story wrote itself and I was curious as everybody else was to find out. My biggest concern was about the rhythm. And that has an interesting effect on the story. For example, after I had introduced character Bridget, it was only a matter of time before I came up with the character Little Man. 
It was like I was a novelist writing about our lives are all interconnected, which was the point of the whole drama. As people living in a co uh, community and in the world, we all impact one another. What I do to you and you do to her and she does to him and he does to someone else is all an endless change of incidents with real life consequences. No doubt I was inspired by the stories, the soap operas that my mother and grandmother obsessed over every day when I was growing up. Everyone has a secret. Everyone has a closet that he or she is trapped inside of and everyone, believe it or not, wants out of that closet. I remember back in Miss McClin's class at Kenwood when she'd play an opera and tell me how I could sing and write like that. I didn't see how. You think you can't, Robert, she said, but I know differently. I know you have this dramatic flair and the gift to tell a long story in your own style, like an opera trapped. My very own hip hopera is a long story where characters never stop singing. It isn't like a musical where there's talking, then a song, then more talking. The story is told in wall to wall song. A single musical theme weaves it all together and there's a conclusion to each chapter, a cliffhanger that comes at the very end and to shock and tease and make you say, what the hell is going to happen next? So we're going to stop right there and we're going to um, move on in, uh, tomorrow. I'm going to try to get this book done before Friday. So yes, what are your views of how Trapped in the Closet came to be? And isn't it ironic how Guilty Until Proven Innocent with Jay-Z was, um, wow, wow, so connected to what's going on in his, um, his life as of 2021? I mean, it's just really crazy. It's, it's really crazy. So what are your views on that? Do you think that I believe that R. Kelly was a strong manifester. I believe that he could think of something and it became real in his world. Um, everyone doesn't know how to tap into that energy. So yeah, I thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please keep your comments coming. And as we end this segment and podcast um, after Solar Coaster is read, we have another good idea for you so we can keep R. Kelly in our midst and we can keep him active. You know, even going back to his old things that he's done is keeping him alive right now, you know, while this case is pending. So thank you so much. Have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow.